Uh, with that, we will begin our first panel, uh, which will be uh, led by uh, Bill Shepard. Uh, it's sort of become a tradition at this event uh, that we begin by speaking with the enforcers to learn about what the trends are uh, in the field. And so with that, I'll pass it off to Bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and thanks, everyone, for coming. It's uh, uh, a bit intimidating, frankly, to be here at a table with the two leading fraud fighters in the free world. Um, but uh, they are kind enough to join us today and, and to give us their inside experience, uh, maybe draw back the curtain a little bit and help us understand uh, what, what's happening within their offices and what they see for the future. Um, because I think that's really what we're here to try and, and help both the, uh, the corporate community, our clients, uh, those of us who are prosecutors to, to help understand how best to interface with their agencies. Um, and uh, it's a real opportunity. And this conference, as opposed to some others that, uh, that might have a thousand people registered, uh, really gives an opportunity for you to participate in it. And I would encourage you as the, uh, as the program goes on, and frankly, as the day goes on, um, to ask questions and to, uh, to participate in it. Those of you in the audience could easily be on these panels. Um, because there is so much experience in the uh, in the seats out in the auditorium, so uh, it's a real pleasure to be here in front of you. And and I will just briefly introduce uh, my my panelists here. Sandra Moser is the uh, head of the the DOJ fraud section, and has a significant background, a strong academic background at uh, UNC and Northwestern. Clerked for a federal judge. Uh, what I like to see is that she also spent some time in private practice um, and uh, helps to see, uh, as, as some in government have a challenge to understand what's going on on the other side, I think it gives her a real strength. Uh, in the U.S., that's not as common as it, as it might be here or in other parts of the world. Um, but she was a, a federal prosecutor in New Jersey, was detailed to the fraud section, and has been there ever since. She's in charge of both Foreign Corrupt Practice Act investigations, um, health care fraud, securities fraud, um, human trafficking falls under her uh, jurisdiction as well. So any major fraud case that's happening in the U.S. comes through her office in some form or fashion, whether it's a partnership with, uh, with a local state attorney general, a, a U.S. attorney's office, or the lawyers that she works with regularly at the Justice Department. And then Lisa Osofsky at the end is the, uh, the seasoned veteran of, uh, of one month, I believe. Just about. Uh, one, one complete month. One month. Uh, at the, <laughs> a long month. Right, at the Serious Fraud it's Office. Blown by. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, but, uh, but before that, she too had, uh, had time advising clients, uh, both at Goldman Sachs, at Exeger, served as a monitor, uh, was gen deputy general counsel at the, uh, the FBI, um, and, uh, and was uh, at the Justice Department before that as well. So really two very seasoned people who, uh, who have a broad base of experience, um, and now Lisa is the, uh, the director of the Serious Fraud Office here in the UK. So they are regular partners, not just on this panel, um, but in real life, their agencies work together regularly. And I thought perhaps maybe we would start by uh, explaining to those in the audience, as the, you know, as Uman talked about, the change in technology and the ability of real-time information to be exchanged back and forth with one another. How does you try and organize your international investigations at the very outset to think about uh, international partners that you might want to work with? Since you're looking at me, I am Lisa. Start. Go right ahead. I don't mean to cut across you, Sandra, <laughs> but I know you're not shy, so you'll you'll chime in when you see fit. That is true. Um, you know, in my view, there's there's plenty to go around in terms of who gets to work on what. Many of our, in terms of law enforcement side of things, we've got plenty of of bad guys out there doing committing crimes and they're often working beyond borders and what that means for me is I get the benefit of working with some of my old colleagues. Sandra for me is great. She's a former AUSA, assistant U.S. attorney like I was. So we both in a way got trained similarly 
like like the the organization I now had, that means I worked very closely with agents, with auditors, with investigators, with um, a whole range of of skills when I made my cases. So I understand where my information is going to come and the kind of specialties I'm going to need to bring to bear to get a case together. And what that also means is I've had a lot of experience working internationally. So it's great for me that someone like Sandra, I can pick up the phone to Sandra and we can talk about mm, even cooperators, you know, information we're getting. And we are getting access to very interesting information across the world and that is incredibly helpful because that means we are talking to each other. The same person who wants to sit in my office and tell me maybe they don't know about a whole lot and you know I can find out from Sandra whether or not that's true. I can test. I can get a good feel for whether I'm being told what's accurate and whether that's um, the kind of, of person sitting in my office I can trust or not. So that is one of the huge benefits to having such a close relationship. It really means a lot to me. I think maybe, you know, I'm here in the first month, but the first week I had Sandra and mm, let's say 12 of her closest friends, but who's counting <laughs> from the FBI, the DOJ, you know, yeah. cast of quite a few. Join, join us, and we all sat together to think through and hash through exactly how we're going to work well together. Again, I don't feel like, I, I do not anticipate the kinds of you know, turf battles that can get other agencies down because I see that there's plenty of work to go around. If we've got a big British brand, it may well be that the SFO is the right place to lead on a case. If we've got a big U.S. company or we've got lots of individuals from the U.S. making critical decisions. It may be the U.S. makes the, the call. If they've developed a cooperator who they've been working with for years, um, that may, again, be, be make a lot more sense for them to go on with their investigation. But that doesn't mean we're not going to be looking at what's in it for the U.K. if there's a sub, if there's other ag you know, agents, if there's people working in our jurisdiction committing crime we're going to want to make sure to investigate them and prosecute them if the evidence is there. So I'd say a lot of it's talking at the outset. We also have a lot of European partners. I know there's people out there who aren't U.S. and U.K. We work very closely with our European partners as well. You can do that under these, you know, there can be joint investigation agreements that allow you to pursue your own course. Obviously, there are differences in the way we do things. I'm both trained in the U.S. originally, but I'm a U.K. I've been, I'm a barrister by training. I get it. We have different rules, and some of those rules mean we can't work together from the start in perfect harmony, doing everything together, saving the taxpayers of both of our jurisdictions money. It may well be that in our country, we've got to record certain interviews under our pay system. That may not behoove, you know, Sandra to have that sort of um, initial interview with someone. I know in my days as a prosecutor, you, know, you typically worked with, you could work with potential um, cooperators or witnesses. You often had an FBI agent or, or another agency take down notes of interviews, but it was a different thing from a verbatim type transcript of the sort you might get in a U.S. grand jury proceeding. So we get that there are differences. One of the things we do is we, when we find them, we talk through it to see how can you get yours and how can we get ours without stepping all over each other and ruining both of our cases. So I realize I've gone on a little bit, but I just wanted to give you a flavor for the kinds of things we do to make sure we're both investigating and prosecuting to the best of our abilities. Yes. Um, first of all, good morning, and thanks for uh, having me here. I appreciate it, all of the sponsors, and I need to make the uh, typical, at least American agency disclaimer that I'm speaking for myself and not officially on behalf of the Department of Justice. So having gotten that out of the way, I appreciate that Lisa went on uh, a bit because she made a lot of excellent points, and she knows that I am uh, fairly jet-lagged. So, <laughs> um, But I echo, I echo um, the vast majority of what she said. I would I would say, look, being a sort of reliable and effective collaborator for me and for the fraud section in Washington is a really um, sort of existential exercise. Our role in the domestic realm, as many of you know, certainly who are U.S. practitioners here, relies on us going out into districts across the country 
and working alongside United States attorneys and other agencies um, and other domestic regulators in order to uh, vindicate the interests of lots of different types of victims from shareholders um, to uh, you know others who may have lost their retirement in a you know complex Ponzi scheme. But that is also true on the international stage. Um, FCPA itself is by definition international and such an increasing number of the corporate enforcement actions and resolutions that have been publicly announced over the past few years have involved coordination in an official way and a sort of divvying up of fines and penalties with other regulators around the world, of course, including the SFO. Um, for the first time uh, in recent months, we worked with France in the Societe Generale uh, resolution, which comprised both FCPA and uh, LIBOR-related conduct. Uh, Singapore, Brazil, the Netherlands, Switzerland, uh, the list has really, as I said, been ever-increasing over the past few years because we recognize that the world is getting smaller. We need to effectively collaborate with other agencies who, of course, seek to um, hold accountable um, those wrongdoers who affect harms in their districts. And it's not always perfect sort of going back to your original question, I think, Bill, is sort of what, how do we think about it from the very beginning? And it's, uh, not to be, it's not that we don't think about it, but we don't always have a clear roadmap, certainly from the beginning when you have an allegation and you don't know all of the twists and turns or uh, exciting um, or uh, dangerous locations, as they may be for some of our attorneys traveling around the world where something might go. So. You can't always set out a perfect roadmap for collaboration with different jurisdictions from the outset because you don't know. And even if you do know, for example, that there is a matter that will involve the SFO and you want to make every effort to collaborate, it's very difficult as it is for whether you're doing an internal investigation, whether you're an outside enforcer using only covert mechanisms, it's very difficult to know from the very beginning of any type of investigation, as you all know, where it might lead you and what the sort of gravity of interests might be in any one place. And so you need to continue to talk about it and um, finding ways to share information where appropriate is always the challenge. And um, we have with the FCA, with the SFO, um, you know, work through those challenges over the years, but it, it can be difficult. And I think um, going back even to your introduction, I just want to be clear that I know both of us recognize the difficulties for defense attorneys in that equation as well, in terms of differing systems, how to respond effectively, how to deal with uh, one agency that might say, don't go interview anybody, and one saying, we'd like to hear the fruits of what your interviews are, are, are telling you. Those are real challenges, and I, I don't profess to have all of the answers for you, but happy to answer questions or uh, draw it out of us as, as we go, because it is, it is difficult, and um, we talk about that, and um, we, we do our best to try to work through it so that you can actually go out and do your job. And, and I think just having that understanding, frankly, of the, uh, the different obligations that a, a company might face from their home regulator and foreign regulators, uh, having that understanding from the government is a, is a huge uh, appreciation and makes it easier for us to, to do our job sometimes. I realize the answer may sometimes be, I know you can't do this, but I really want you to. Right, right. Um, I need that information, uh, you know. So, so I understand that uh, the reluctance on that. One of the areas I think that's particularly a, ch a challenge, um, and in in sort of in the U.S. domestic side, attorney-client privilege is similar throughout the state. And whether you've got a task force with, um, you know, uh, local police and a state regulator and DOJ the attorney-client privilege rules are essentially the same. Um, but when you, I see, you shake yeah. your head a little bit, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, w when you move to different countries and different legal traditions, it becomes that more complicated. Um, Lisa, when, when you're looking at cases and trying to, to put together a group of, of international partners, uh, that I think is one area that's particularly of interest to uh, to clients to know what they can feel confident in sharing with their lawyers, uh, to know that it won't end up uh, at the government's office. Well, I think in some ways without, I, I don't want to overstate it, but 
I think in some ways our system got a little more similar to yours in the very recent past. We've had a big decision on privilege, and it was up to me to decide whether we would appeal that decision or not. It was a very factually based decision by a very well-regarded court, um, Levison and Voss, and some of our, our most well-regarded judges made a factual determination that the company in that particular case had a well-founded, they, they were afraid of being prosecuted, and so that what they did was able to take advantage of, of legal privilege there. I think to a lot of lawyers that, that smelled a little more like the U.S. system and what they knew about the U.S. system. <clears throat> Obviously, there are differences in our system. Also, there was plenty of language in that decision that basically told us that, um, that the judges sitting on that panel understood that cooperation with the SFO meant it, it, that, that, th that waiving privilege might be part of the cooperation story if a company were to come to the SFO to talk to us. So that, that was a decision where, where uh, I understood what was being said. Again, a factual decision is a different kind of matter than a purely legal or appellate decision. Um, and there, you know, my message to our community is people still know what it's like to cooperate. I, I understand cooperation when I see it. I know what it's like. I know what doesn't look like cooperation. And Judge Brian Levison and, and the rest of the esteemed panel recognized that there, if, if you want to cooperate with the government, that may well mean giving certain information where you could claim privilege. And even the court recognized that. So I think, you know, in a way, it, it might make it easier for certain practitioners. I'm not saying that everybody out there is either U.S. or U.K., um, but, and of course, I'm not going into all the, the nuances of legal advice privilege versus, uh, but bottom line, I think, you know, this, my message is we still know what cooperation means, and in our country, that as recognized by the court, that still can include waivers of privilege if you want to come cooperate and talk to us. So I think, and that, you know, I think in a way, maybe that makes it easier for us in the long run in certain ways, but I think, I think I'd be very, I think Sandra would hit me if, if, if she thought, I, you know. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> I don't want to speak for her about what cooperation looks like for her in her jurisdiction. <clears throat> it's almost like the obscenity, you know, we know it when we see right. it. Right. And, and I think we both are experienced enough to know what it means to be deciding to play ball with the government and, and really being difficult and not really wanting to cooperate. Sure. Look, I think, as Lisa said, I saw her, I think, just a couple of days or the day of maybe that the ENRC opinion came out and I said I think I think I, I understand that it was difficult for many in the office who had litigated it a long time we, we have encountered the same thing on our end and when it doesn't go your way you need to pivot and adjust and um, figure out the the way forward but in my I think sort of off the cuff remark to her at the time was I think it might have made our jobs a little bit easier in terms of coordination because I think it, it does bring um, their system slightly closer to what, what we experience. And um, when you were introing, I, it wasn't to be flipped to say, well, you know, they're not, with respect to privilege in the states, um, th there is a lot of, of course, um, uniformity in some respects. But I think just as there are a lot of questions for companies um, who are seeking to cooperate or figuring out what to what degree that they want to cooperate. There are a lot of nuances and complexities that we see with respect to um, some of the privilege calls and, and associated um, attempts at waiver or, or not with respect to cooperating companies. And while we in the U.S. certainly cannot request under our policies that a company waive we certainly have instances, and, and Lisa was alluding to this, in which companies do selectively waive portions of their um, investigation in order to provide uh, more fulsome information in the course of cooperating. And I would just say something that we've thought about a lot internally, and I believe and I think that um, those in the white collar defense bar are, are thinking about and struggling through is really, and, and now is also going to be um, even more true in, in, in dealing with uh, UK authorities, is really 
how to share information from the beginning with the government and thinking that through and um, expecting, um, not expecting sort of just a um, go along to get along response from the government. There are many, many years, including during some of my time at the fraud section where firms are coming in and giving hypothetical mm -hmm. sort of proffers of what if asked, what their employees might say. And at the end of the day, that's not usable evidence for us. And so um, we understand that not every firm wants to make the decision to come in. And again, we certainly can't and don't ask to come in and waive. But there have been some recent court opinions in the US that acknowledge that those types of situations where you're coming in and giving essentially verbatim downloads of what a witness has told you in an internal investigation are waived communications. And um, while we're certainly not trying to set some trap for anybody, there's been a sort of um, song and dance understanding on that front for a long time in the attorney proffer context. And, um, it's it's my interest to acquire usable evidence and information and so we're not really content to sort of accept that information in at all times in the normal course mm -hmm. and so of course part of that that dance from the corporate side is not just that they're concerned about you and your enforcement action of course. but the trial bar is out there too right yeah. and so that's a, a huge issue uh, in the United States the the whistleblower issue uh, and bounties for whistleblowers is also a significant uh, part of the practice. Well, uh, in you know, the, in our in case, US. we don't have them. A, so a, it just makes exactly. it either easier or a little less easy, to, depending on how you put it. Right, exactly. And that's one of the key differences, right? And, and uh, a group that came over from the UK to meet with Justice Department and SEC and uh, other law enforcement counterparts uh, as part of that parliamentary inquiry um, actually was part of an outgrowth of this conference a few years ago. Um, and so when they were in the United States, met with defense lawyers and relator counsel to, to get a better sense of that. Um, I don't know if you see that ever changing here in the UK. I mean, uh, political <coughs> pressures and, and uh, news of the day can, can oftentimes force people to take another look at issues. but. More recently, the news of the day seems to be revolving around one topic in this jurisdiction, and it has nothing to do with whistleblowers. It's around Brexit. And so I would say for the, for the foreseeable future, many of our politicians are busy. They're focused on something other than this. Um, I, I see the value in, in, in bounties in the following sense. You know, and this is as a person, this is not as representative of the SFO. My own experience is that plenty of whistleblowers can never work again. Once they blow the whistle, once they crack open a case, they may well never be able to work. And I appreciate that that may mean that I, I, I can understand. I know everybody loves the headlines where, where there's just an extreme amount of money given to a whistleblower. And then don't we love the whistleblowers who don't want to take a penny because they're just doing it for you know truth and justice. So I realize there's a great media story to be told around all this. But I'd say that for our jurisdiction, for the UK, um, we are. We, I am not looking to change the law here. I don't see the opportunity. I don't see the focus on this issue right now. And frankly, it's not that I don't need it. Of course, I'm a prosecutor. I want every tool I can possibly get. I'm really, really greedy. And so if, if, if there was a government decision to pay people to come in, that sounds good, you know, just a little bit more. But frankly, we're finding people who, who, who come in for a variety of reasons, and it's a cultural difference here. We don't, we don't want to be paying people. It's a, just a different mindset about what motivates the folks who come forward. And I've been really pleased to see over my very brief tenure that we've actually got people who come in for for really good reasons, for because they're bothered by what they're seeing around them. Or they may, may be a compliance officer sitting and watching things that they feel tarred by, and they don't want to have a life where they feel complicit in some way. So I'm seeing the kind of the, the good news, more heartwarming side of this, where, where we're getting information and we're working well with, with individuals even without the bounty part. Again, 
I'd never say no if, if, if somebody came and offered it to me on a silver platter because, and it's not that I think it's horrible. I understand some of the motivations behind the law, the way it sits in the U.S., but I, can, I, can, I think I was at, it may have even been an event like this a couple years ago in this very auditorium where we had the FCA on here, and I think right. Stewart was like, we'd never do that, you know, no, no chance right, of right. that. And Felicity. I don't think I'm misquoting him, but, you right. know, and I think I was actually in the audience saying about what about the fact that they'll never work again, and, and some other people right. were nodding. But right. I don't right. see it changing here anytime soon, and right now I don't feel that this is one of the tools I must have tomorrow or I can't do my job. Mm -hmm. And to clarify for those who are perhaps in the audience who are only UK practitioners, the Department of Justice does not have a paid bounty or cooperation system either. There are whistleblowers who come forward under the SEC's uh, regulators, sort of anonymous program who we ultimately do get access to if they so choose to, mm -hmm. or provide us information similarly, but there is no sort of paid bounty system in our criminal side of the house. Right, and I guess some would argue that in the, the FCA context, mm -hmm. um, in the, the KETAM context, that that's a sort of de facto bounty that gets paid to the relator in those cases handled by the department. If that is true. The department does. That, that, is, that is true. I think, though, there, as Lisa said, I mean, what a, what a headline. I mean, trust me, when I see a headline, I think, I'm in the wrong business. <laughs> I, I should just go work for a sort of corrupt company, report it, and take, you know, retire. Take, <laughs> take the money. Um, I'll know what to look for when I'm there, and I won't participate in the wrongdoing. So I'll set myself and take up good notes. in the best, right? Um, but uh, no, those cases are few and far between. They are extraordinarily, um, there is, I think, a cottage industry of relators council, and particularly in the healthcare uh, fraud mm -hmm. space, um, of, of course, but um, the headlines are few and far between, and certainly that is true for the SEC's side of the house as well. Okay. Well, another topic, Lisa, that is sort of news of the day, uh, particularly here, is the anti-money laundering. Uh, and efforts at, at ramping up those enforcements. You know, I'd be interested in, in both of you commenting on not just AML, but asset seizures and forfeitures, uh, which I think can, can be a significant tool for law enforcement to take away money from criminal organizations, um, but also sometimes in the effort to, to go after and accomplish that goal, uh, you know, it's difficult to make sure that you're getting just the bad guy's money and not somebody else's too. Yeah, well, that's interesting. And I know our, our, our kind host also talked about money laundering be, being very much in the in, in forefront of, of minds. We had a show he, out here recently called McMafia that I think actually did have a big impact on what people were thinking about in terms of, oh, my goodness, is our entire country being bought up by 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 people other than us, whatever us means. I mean, one of the things that's great about living here is we are in a truly international world. I do feel fortunate that even with my accent, I'm allowed to, you know, to become a citizen, to stay, to feel like part of part of being here. But so I'm not talking about any specific um, cultural identities or every any specific and ethnicities. But I think one thing that I, I learned sort of first day on the job as the money laundering reporting officer at Goldman Sachs right after the Proceed to Crime Act came into effect was our money laundering rules are quite helpful in a way, um, very broad, helpful to prosecutors now, now that I am one. At the time, I wasn't, but they're very broad. And so to make out a money laundering charge is not all that difficult in this jurisdiction if you've got the kind of criminality that the SFO is pursuing, so complex fraud, co uh, um, corruption cases. The kinds of work that we're doing, there will always be a question in my mind, where's the money laundering charge that goes with that? Because money is moving in the cases we see. Where's it going? Of course, that'll be interesting. I did a, a, a report for the police board in the home office 25 years ago that looked at how are we doing asset confiscations. And one of the things I was amazed about was our courts weren't necessarily as switched on as we'd want them to be about exactly how to move confiscation cases 
through the process. At the same time, we know, I know talking to criminals from, from my early days in Chicago as an AUSA, you'd say, okay, you know, you're going to jail and we're going to take your money. And they'd be like, well, I'll go to jail. That's okay. <laughs> Just don't take my money. That's so you know it matters. <laughs> you know it matters. And people like us, I think, you know, it's, so, it's hard to get your head around it. You mean you'd actually rather sit in Rikers Island or Wandsworth Prison or whatever and wait for your pot? Yeah, as long as my pot of gold's there, that's fine. So, you know, I think we understand as, as enforcers and as prosecutors, we get it that this is hugely, hugely important to, to criminals. They're motivated by this. So I know I'm looking at potential money laundering charges every time a case is brought to me for me to consider whether we're going to go ahead on it. That's for sure. I know I'm looking to work with our judges and the court system to make sure there's as much understanding about what we're doing in this area. And I think we're, you know, the, the benefit of this job now, I'm running around talking to, to everybody, including, you know, Lynn Owens, who heads our National Crime Agency, who's got a lot of um, stature in this area. They've got different tools from us. They, too, are interested in money laundering. So when Lynn and I, just, just as Sandra and I have decided, we're going to try to work together wherever we can within the bounds of the law, same with Lynn Owens, same with Mark Stewart and his, bo and his boss, um, Andrew Bailey at the FCA. So we're looking for, and the City of London Police, who've got a lead in terms of certain kinds of cases, you know, we're looking for the synergies and we're looking for how we can bring those different tools. But s safe to say, that's a particular area for me of interest. We've beefed up our department, and before I got there, I can't take credit for it, but we have a very, very, um, we've had a big focus on proceeds of crime in the SFO for a while, and I'll be looking on, forward to leveraging on that, to bringing in new new ideas to that area, and to build on our successes on that in the past. So, I know that's a wide a wide ranging kind of answer, but I think you know you asked an open question, right, so right. I jumped right in. I hope I hope I've given you, you a flavor for for where I think we're headed in that area. Great. Yeah. For us, it goes, I mean, look, doing, having, we have exclusive jurisdiction over the FCPA, and so it goes hand in hand. Um, mm -hmm. We always talk about, um, I mean, the FCPA is one statute, um, but we talk about FCPA-related offenses and money laundering, of course, um, if you're paying, you know, millions or sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars in bribes to people that are overseas and um, uh, often a jurisdictional hook for us in the United States involves the use of our financial systems and the movement of money through our financial systems. And so while we do have in the criminal division at the department a money laundering and asset recovery section that is separate and apart from the fraud section and we work with them frequently, they also look into kleptocracy and, and certain other mm -hmm. issues. We've got a lot of expertise in that area and um, it just goes hand in glove with, with what we what we do every day. So the specific work you do in FCPA, just by its very nature, involves a variety of of uh, com uh, countries, a variety of enforcement authorities. We've talked about the investigation piece of this, but but help us understand if it gets to a resolution, if a, if the government's going to proceed and there's going to be some sort of a resolution, short of indictment, if it's going to be a, a deferred prosecution, non-prosecution agreement, but you have seven different countries that might be interested uh, in the same, the same conduct, um, the same <clears throat> fining, right, the same asset yeah. forfeitures. Um, you know, the, the piling on memo, uh, as it's referred to, um, talk, talks a little bit about that. Help us understand sort of strategically how to approach various uh, enforcement authorities that might be interested in the same conduct. Well, certainly the, the memo that, that um, Bill is referencing is, um, I think we, we talked about it when in its informal stage too much, um, or I did, at least as anti-piling on, and so that name stuck, even though now it's something that's enshrined in our um, newly renamed, it was the U.S. Attorney's Manual, but it is now called the Justice Manual, um, if you're Googling and, and trying to find things, as we do even in the Justice Department to try to find things, it's quite large. Um, it um, has a, lots and lots of words, much, much longer title than piling on, which I won't repeat here, but it essentially is all about um, that sort of uh, coordination of penalties and the recognition that there should be one pie um, and not 
and not eight different um, groups all all taking the full pie every time that there might be a resolution that involves different equities and interests from um, their countries. And this just formalizes that. So certainly an approach that you should take with the Justice Department is to make sure that they are aware of that policy. There are certainly offices or prosecutors you might be working with that are not doing just FCPA work and don't do this every day and aren't aware of um, that requirement to coordinate. And um, it, it grew out of much more than just internal in, in within the department coordination, although of course we can't at the department require uh, the CFTC or Lisa or um, uh, the PNF in, in France to coordinate and, and take a certain approach. We found that nonetheless, we've had tremendous success with doing it. And part of that I do credit to um, the fraud section in the department and that is because we have approached resolutions including our most recent, uh, for example, with Petrobras um, where we, um, um, gave is the wrong word, but the apportionment, the apportionment of the monies paid by uh, Petrobras, 80% of that went to Brazil. Um, mm. And that's a reflection of a lot of things, um, some of which, um, and, and those that I can talk about, are really explicated in um, an attempt at um, transparency, which is something we've really been pushing as well over the last couple of years in terms of being more transparent about the way we're thinking and how we are reaching certain resolutions. And the, the piling on or anti-piling on is part of that. Um, certain, certain countries come to us with a lot of information and, and Brazil is, is an example of that. And that occurred also with Odebrecht and Brascom. And um, you know, could they have gotten a resolution done um, in their own country? Don't I will nonetheless take that on. as a cue to wrap up my uh, <laughs> my comments on this. Right. But uh, look, we take it. The, the point is to say we take it seriously. So much so that it was a policy objective that we really pursued and, and pushed at the fraud section. And it's terrific that we have um, leadership under um, this current administration that that took it seriously as well, and that it it was memorialized in an official in an official way. And again. Um, a, the majority of the resolutions we've done over the past couple of years, even before this was actually enshrined, adhere to that, both on the domestic front with our regulatory partners, as well as um, on the global front. Mm -hmm. Lisa, how do you try and uh, keep track of that and make sure that companies aren't paying the same fine five or six times? Yeah, well, we don't we don't have that memo here. You know, we've all read that memo. We all listen closely to what U.S. Justice Department says on things, because obviously. You know, they've been at the FCPA game for a good long time. We are newer to the party. We have a different kind of system in so many ways. For example, you mentioned NPAs. Well, we don't have those here. And you mentioned DP. We don't have DPAs against individuals. We just have a very different system in some ways. And I think that's one of our ways we avoid piling on is that when Sandra and I get a case early on that might have touch points in both jurisdictions, we actually talk to understand how the systems are different so that we don't fall over ourselves, so that we don't in an unintentionally pile on or, or you know, it's neither, it's, it's, no, it's in no one's interest to, to simply try to put a company out of business by getting the same fine twice, thrice, and, and five times. That's certainly not, not my objective. And, and I, I think it's safe to say it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be anyone's as well. So um, some of it's just being creative. I mean, if we don't necessarily, let's say we can't use a certain legal tool to do some of what what was mentioned earlier, and I was I wasn't part of the SFO, but again, I feel like I want to take a little credit for it. You know, reading about using civil recovery orders to get huge sums back to to African nations who were harmed in certain events, and so it may not be in the perfect um, you know little box that looks exactly the same as the box that sits on different prosecutors' desks, but if we all have a recognition, as, as we do here in our, in our country, that if, there's, there's, if there are victims, if they have been harmed, if there's a way to get them some money back for whatever the harm that is, we're gonna try to do it to the best of our ability, and we're not gonna, we're not going to necessarily look at things in a in a tick box way or a black and white way about how we're going to proceed. We're going to look for those tools that enable us to make 
make people whole to the to to the best we you know as, as well as we possibly can and within our system so i'd say a little bit of creativity on this way a little bit of um of transparent discussion early on about where it really makes sense to be prosecuting certain kinds of offenses, what jurisdiction really is the best one for certain cases. Remember, we work with countries all over the world where there may be a real national interest in a particular company or a particular kind of crime or a particular individual. And of course, we don't want to just be pushing everybody out of the way and, and saying it's, it's our case. You know, we want to work well with, with everybody in the sandbox. And so I think there's a real incentive for us to figure out where's the best, where's the real locus, where's the best place for this to be pursued. And regardless of the fact that I don't have a memo over my head telling me not to pile on, we're not going to pile on. We're going to we're going to do sensible prosecutions following the evidence in our jurisdiction, and we're going to do them hopefully in a way that puts some money back in the pockets of those who have been harmed along the way. Individual. Well, great. Well, uh, help me thank our uh, our panelists. It's great. Uh, great to have you.